So far, we've been looking at probably, historically at least, one of the central problems in uh, the philosophy of mind uh, to do with uh, the mind-body the mind -body problem, uh, which has to do with phenomenal consciousness, qualia, phenomenality. How do we uh, reconcile that with uh, a physicalist view of the world and so on? But philosophy of mind is a very broad uh, sub discipline in philosophy, and there are lots of other questions. So in the last two weeks, so next week will be the last week of uh, lectures, because we missed out on our reading week, so you're just going to have a reading week at the end. Um, so for this week and next week, we're going to look at uh, briefly, very briefly, uh, you could do a whole unit, uh, as we've done so far on phenomenal consciousness on either of these uh, topics. But we're going to look briefly at two other uh, issues in philosophy of mind. Uh, so along with the problem of phenomenal consciousness that we've been looking at, probably the other biggest problem in philosophy of mind is the problem of intentionality. Uh, and that's, as we'll see, a question about how it is, especially for a physicalist, uh, something like a human brain can come to have representational states um, at all. So how the brain or the mind can uh, represent um, things in the outside world, how um, you can have a mental state that's about something else. And in particular today we'll look at um, Daniel Dennett's uh, intentional systems theory. Okay, so that's the lecture for today. We'll look at, uh, briefly just at intentionality and propositional attitudes first. I've mentioned propositional attitudes a few times, but we'll go over them in more detail now. Uh, then we'll look at intentional systems theory and very briefly at um, one objection uh, to intentional systems theory. Okay, so intentionality and propositional attitudes. What's going on here? So first, folk psychology. Folk psychology is sort of the, um, the ordinary way in which we think about each other and each other's mental states and how we explain and predict um, one another's behavior, in particular in terms of things like beliefs and desires. So when somebody does something, you can attribute certain beliefs to them and certain desires to them uh, because of what they've done. Um, so I'm sitting at a table and somebody uh, brings in some food, delicious looking food, and puts it at a nearby table and I leap up and I run over and I start devouring the food like a maniac. Uh, and so you might attribute certain beliefs and desires to me. Uh, in that case, you say, well, he obviously is hungry and he desires to eat. Uh, and uh, he believes that that stuff there is good enough uh, for that purpose. And we do this all the time. Um, when we pass each other on the street, uh, and it's a funny thing, you know, moving from country to country, as I have in the last number of years, you'll find, or I've found, uh, that norms about how you walk on the street or maneuver around other people are very different from culture to culture. Uh, so in Ireland, it's just crazy. There's no, like, you should pass on the left or pass on the right. You just sort of aim for gaps wherever you can, okay? Uh, in the U.S. and Canada, uh, you do like the traffic does, so you pass on the same side as the traffic. In Australia, there's, so far, as far as I can discern, there's kind of, a, um, kind of a norm like that, so you pass on the other side, the side that we drive on in Ireland too, uh, which is different than the United States or Canada, but, but it's not quite that, because I think there's enough of a mix of other people from other countries uh, where they pass on the other side, that especially in the CBD, people get confused, uh, and there are other norms, I think, influencing how people behave here uh, as pedestrians. Uh, but basically, when we're, when we're walking down the street, we have to be able to attribute certain, even implicitly, certain desires and beliefs uh, to other people uh, in order to predict and explain their behavior, even in mundane contexts, like uh, how to get across the road or uh, walk down the street. Okay. So what we're doing in those cases is we're attributing intentional states or propositional attitudes um, to people. So a propositional attitude, and we'll talk about it more in a moment, is just something like a belief or a desire. It's an attitude that you can take towards some sort of proposition or content. So um, 
this food is good to eat is a proposition. And I might have uh, a propositional attitude of belief towards that proposition. So I believe that this food is good uh, to eat. Uh, and I might also have the propositional attitude of desire uh, towards, roughly speaking, towards that content. So I desire that, uh, let's say I eat that food, it's slightly different. But. Okay, so we do this kind of thing all the time. Uh, there are lots of examples. I've just thrown up a kind of a cartoon example here. But the question we'll be looking at today is how we can move from uh, that ordinary practice of folk psychology of uh, attributing beliefs and desires to each other to some general account of intentionality um, in philosophy of mind. Okay, so propositional attitudes. First, they have what philosophers call content. So they represent an actual or possible state of affairs and are capable, this is really important, they're capable of being true or false. So they have semantic properties, where that just means that they're capable of being true or false. So I believe that there is um, a pink elephant in the corner of the room right now. That is the content there, the propositional content is there is a pink elephant in the corner of the room right now. I have the propositional attitude of belief towards that content. And that content uh, has uh, the semantic property of being false, as it turns out. So, uh, but the, the, the important point is that that, semantic, or that content has um, the capability of being true or false. Somebody brings in a pink elephant and puts it in the corner of the room, uh, and now I'm representing um, an actual state of affairs, and my, that proposition will be uh, true. So we can have all kinds of, um, there can be content in all kinds of states and thoughts, beliefs, intentions, intending to do something or intending that something be the case, desires, doubts, memory, and so on. So remember, a propositional attitude is an attitude that you have toward a proposition, namely a, a, a statement that has content like that. Okay. And so the general structure of proposition, propositional attitudes will be something like this. An agent S will have A, attitude A, uh, that P, proposition P. Now often propositional attitudes will have this that structure, um, but it can be a little bit artificial to put some of the propositional attitudes into that form. Um, you know, I can desire uh, that something be the case. Uh, but we don't normally uh, or always say that. We just say, I desire to eat, not I desire that I have something to eat. So they're not always expressed exactly with that um, structure, but that's the general structure of propositional attitudes. Uh, S, an agent uh, like you or me, has particular propositional attitude A towards a proposition, or particular attitude A towards a proposition. So, for example, Lucy believes, remembers, hopes, etc., that the uh, sun is shining. Now, there's lots of complicated issues here that we're going to be skating over quite um, uh, quickly, but just to mention them, uh, in passing at least, the truth or fulfillment conditions are going to vary uh, not only with the content, so that's obvious, I think, uh, it should be. How, how do um, the truth conditions vary with the content? Well, I believe that there is a pink elephant in the corner of the room here right now. Um, well, that content, as it turns out, is false. Okay. Um, I might also have the belief uh, that uh, this bag is brown. Well, that's true. Uh, and so the, the, truth condition, or the, the, um, the truth of the proposition is changing, obviously, with the content. That's not mysterious. Um, but what you may not notice from, um, from the outset is that the truth of, of, or fulfillment conditions change with the attitude. What does that mean? Well, think about belief and desire. So I believe that... Um, there's some nice food there to eat or something, or I desire that there be some nice food there to eat. Now, in the case of belief, it's kind of like perception. My belief is true, roughly speaking, just in case uh, there really is some nice food there to eat. If there isn't any nice food there to eat, then my belief that there is is obviously false. 
But if I hope or desire or wish that there be something nice there to eat, that propositional attitude has a different type of satisfaction or fulfillment condition. It's not strictly speaking here a truth condition because we're not, uh, we don't assess it by looking and seeing whether there is something there to eat. Um, instead, it's a, there's a kind of a fulfillment condition. I, need, I want the world to change uh, so that it will in fact include as part of it some food there that's nice to eat. So the truth or fulfillment, uh, fulfillment conditions change depending on the, uh, the attitude. So um, basically a belief represents the world as being a certain way and it's true just in case the world is that way. Uh, a desire uh, has a satisfaction condition uh, and it is satisfied or fulfilled uh, just in case the world uh, gets to be a certain way, the way that you want it to be. So it's slightly different. Okay. Um, now the interesting thing about intentional states, uh, now intentional states just are content-bearing states. Uh, any state that uh, has content in that way. So a mental state like a belief is going to be an intentional state because it has content of a certain kind. Um, now the interesting thing about these intentional states is that they're about something. So if I have the belief that there's some nice food over there to eat, then uh, if there really is some nice food over there to eat, uh, I have a belief about some state of the world. Uh, so they, the belief itself refers to something uh, other than itself, beyond the belief. It goes out to the world uh, and um, is a claim about how the world actually is. And if the world is that way, then it's a belief about that state of affairs. So uh, as, the, uh, as uh, Jacob puts it in the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia article, Intentionality, intentionality is the power of minds to be about, to represent, uh, or to stand for things, properties, and states of affairs. So I put at the end here that this shouldn't be confused with the intention in the ordinary uh, sense, so I intend to go and get a cup of coffee or something. Uh, so an intention in that... Uh, sense is in fact just another propositional attitude. It's the attitude of intention towards a proposition. Um, so it's just, an every, it's just one more example of uh, an intentional state. But the important thing here is just that intentional states represent uh, or at least putatively represent states of affairs, say roughly speaking, in the world. And they can be true or false. Obviously, this guy, if he is dreaming that he's outside walking in the sun, um, he might have some dreamlike belief state. I'm outside walking in the sun. But that propositional attitude um, uh, taken towards that content means that um, the belief is uh, false in this case. Now, you might think, well, this is not really sounding very mysterious. Maybe it's not sounding as mysterious as the... Um, problem of phenomenology, of qualia. But it, it is a bit of a mystery how some things in the world get to represent other things, how that's possible. Uh, what determines the content, say, of mental representations. Uh, and in particular, what we're trying to do here is explain uh, intrinsic or original intentionality, not derived intentionality. All that means is that, for our present purposes, is that we might say that something... Um, we can just give it uh, meaning uh, or something, just arbitrarily, and so we'll have a derived intentionality. I can say that this, from henceforth, uh, whenever we are in this classroom talking about philosophy, this bottle uh, means uh, something, right? And I just pick something for it to mean. And it's about that thing then, but just arbitrarily, um, we pick it as a sign for something else. And that's just derived intentionality. It gets its intentionality uh, in a derivatory way from me, just assigning it that intentionality. But original or intrinsic intentionality seems to um, primarily, or perhaps exclusively, seemingly exclusively, uh, pertain to mental states. Uh, when we have a mental state, like a belief about the world, it's not like our belief 
uh, gets its intentionality, the fact that it's about something just arbitrarily, uh, in the way that I might give some intentionality to uh, a bottle or any other sign, uh, object that I would use as a sign, um, in the way that that gets its meaning. It just seems to have the meaning, your belief, your mental state just seems to have that intentionality um, by itself. Okay, so the, there is a problem here about especially how to give um, that, ex explain that kind of intentionality in naturalistic terms. Um, now one way of doing it, which I've just gestured at at the bottom here in a, an article from, again from the Santa Encyclopedia uh, on mental representation, is to say that any structure or system that has the capacity to be information bearing um, can be uh, intentional in, even in an intrinsic way. So obviously if some system uh, is bearing information maybe just because we're uh, putting that information into it, uh, it might not count. Uh, but any system that uh, could uh, bear information in the right sort of way uh, could be intrinsically, uh, could have intrinsic intentionality. Uh, and the idea here is that, uh, f especially in relation to the computational theory of mind, roughly speaking, the view that um, our minds can be made sense of in a way analogous to how computers work, uh, that mental representation, we have basically a symbolic language, um, mental language, and uh, that the, the symbols of that language are operated on by various uh, rules um, and in that way our cognitive states and processes are actually in a real sense computational. And so the idea here is that a mental representation um, as a basic concept of the computational theory of mind uh, might say that well look cognitive states and processes are constituted by the occurrence, transformation and storage of information bearing structures. Uh, and so that kind of intentionality isn't any more mysterious than uh, some other um, intentional system, even uh, sort of moderately intentional system like a thermostat that uh, seems to intrinsically bear information about the uh, temperature in the uh, ambient environment. Okay, so here the idea is that we can um, uh, give some sort of naturalistic account of uh, intrinsic intentionality in terms of uh, information, just the capacity to bear uh, information. Okay, so I'm just gesturing at that as a whole research project in philosophy, but um, it gives you some idea at least about how a physicalist or a naturalist would uh, try to give an account, a uh, naturalistic account of intentionality. Now, the idea of intentionality goes way back um, Franz Brentano, a German uh, philosopher, thought in particular that it was the, the mark of the mental. What does that mean? Well, just that if we're looking for something uh, by which we can uh, define what a, a mental state is, uh, the suggestion here is that uh, a mental state is a sort of state that can have um, a certain kind of intrinsic um, intentionality that being about something in that way is the mark of what it is to be mental. And that's a slightly different characterization, of course, than, say, the one we looked at when we looked at Nagel, where he thinks that uh, phenomenal states in particular uh, are defined by what it's like for the creature uh, to be in them or to undergo them. So roughly this idea says that all mental states are characterized by intentionality, even phenomenal states. Uh, although there might be a problem there, and no physical phenomena, at least no physical phenomena outside of uh, human brains, uh, are characterized by uh, intentionality. Um, now this expression comes up, I know, in the unit guide, um, uh, in, 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 uh, intentional inexistence. I've always had terrible trouble with this expression. Um, but for present purposes, don't get too hung up, because there are actually debates about what the heck this expression even means. Um, but the idea here is just that whenever a mental state, like a thought or a belief, is about a certain object or state of affairs, 
that state of affairs or object seems to exist within the mental state. It's like a, it's stamped in there. It's represented. Um, and so the object is in some sense contained within that mental state. Uh, it's represented, let's say, in that mental state. Uh, now that's going to be the case not only for objects that actually exist, but also for imaginary ones. So um, you can say or believe something like, uh, all unicorns are white. Uh, you have a state that is uh, directed at the world, uh, is putatively about something. Of course, it's about nothing, because we'll assume that there are no unicorns. Uh, but that object that you are purporting to um, have uh, to, to say exists, and you have a particular, a particular belief about it, is still, as it were, stamped in your mind. Okay? Uh, and so it exists there as a representation, at least. Okay. Now this issue about uh, intention, intentionality and phenomenality, uh, there are multiple intersecting issues here. Um, one thing you might worry about is whether you can really give uh, a representational analysis of um, the phenomenal characters, the sort of qualia or phenomenal characters we've been looking at, like uh, having a particular pain or taste or color experience. Um, so can we really explain the way a particular pain feels by um, appealing to its informational content? Uh, or even um, having a color experience? So it's a very large project in the philosophy of mind to try and give an account of phenomenal states like that entirely in terms of their representational or intentional content. Uh, and that's an attempt, a naturalistic attempt, to um, naturalize phenomenology. But it's not clear that it's successful. And some people think that uh, some phenomenal states uh, have a certain kind of uh, content. Uh, you, it's not that you explain the phenomenology in terms of some informational content about the world. But in fact, phenomenal states themselves uh, give us uh, intentional content. So. Uh, if I have uh, a certain experience as of some things being the case, the actual phenomenology, I can just read off a certain kind of uh, content from that. So that's what some people uh, think. And then there's the other issue about whether um, there is phenomenal content attached to uh, intentional states that aren't um, paradigmatically phenomenal states. So beliefs. Is it like something to believe? that uh, there is a table here. So when you look at the table, maybe you have an experience of roughly kind of creamy whiteness on the top, and uh, it's like something to have that visual experience, but is it like something to believe that there is a table there? Some people think that doesn't make any sense. Uh, other people, for example, uh, Tim Bain, who works in the philosophy department here, um, think that it does make sense and that there uh, is phenomenology attached to uh, having a belief that something is the case? You might also wonder whether there are different phenomenologies attached to um, different attitudes that we can have towards the same um, propositional content. So um, I believe that there's a table there, or for some bizarre reason I desire that there be a table there. Uh, is there something different in how it feels when I just switch from having the belief to having the desire, when the uh, content uh, stays the same? Um, it's not clear that there is. It seems like phenomenology might be too coarse-grained in that sort of situation uh, to individuate uh, certain uh, uh, attitude types. So different mental states like beliefs or desires that have the same content. So I'm just flagging a number of issues here that we could end up spending a whole unit on or something. Um, and then I've just uh, restated this issue about whether we can give a representational account of phenomenal character. For anybody who's interested, uh, there's a link here to some of the stuff that uh, Tim Bain works on um, uh, with Michelle Montague. There's a, a book they put out on cognitive phenomenology. That's on the, on the idea that our uh, cognitive states, like state uh, belief states actually have phenomenology attached uh, to them. Okay, so that's um, intentionality and the propositional attitudes.
a whole bunch of stuff going on, but the main points to uh, take away for now um, is that an intentional state is a state that has uh, content. That's propositional content, and it can be true or false, um, so it has semantic properties. Uh, and in, so far as it has satisfaction conditions like that, those satisfaction conditions can change when the uh, attitude we can take towards that propositional content, so the propositional attitude uh, changes, say from belief uh, to desire. Okay, so that's what these things are. Now let's move on to Dennett's intentional systems uh, theory. Uh, 